Opportunity. It's why we're all here. And it's one big opportunity. It's probably the biggest opportunity that I've seen in the last 20 years. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. It's a real pleasure to be asked to be here. My name is Shane Kehoe. I'm one of the co-founders of SVK Crypto. My background before I started SVK Crypto was a portfolio manager in the city. I was on the buy side. I was a fund manager for going on almost 15 years. And my last major role was with a very large hedge fund here called Bluecrest Capital Management. I ran equity capital markets. I invested in good old IPOs. But now I've left the dark side of finance behind me and I solely focus on cryptocurrencies and blockchain technologies. SVK Crypto is a community driven investment firm based here in London, focusing on blockchain technologies and digital assets globally. We realize that it's not just about writing checks, it's not just about capital allocation, it's about community. In order for us to have adoption, we have to have people use blockchain. We have to have it so by it's so simple, it's so easy that people can use it without even knowing it's on a decentralized system. And for that, it really needs to start with one thing, community. My presentation today is going to have two little pieces of video content, really just to kind of show where we are. And then I'm going to kind of talk about the opportunity as how we see it. The most recent news from SVK Crypto is we've recently just launched a fund. It's a venture capital fund. As some of you may already know, uh, it's backed by Block One. Block One are the creators of the EOS token and have allocated a billion dollars to various different, various different VC uh, funds around the world to really focus on the EOS IO ecosystem. Opportunity. It's why we're all here. And it's one big opportunity. It's probably the biggest opportunity that I've seen in the last 20 years. And when I look back at the tech revolution and what's currently going on in the tech within blockchain, I think it supersedes it by 10 to 100 fold. But in order to understand the opportunity, we really have to understand where we've come from. And when we started initially investing into cryptocurrency and blockchain technology, it was through Bitcoin. Bitcoin was really the first investment that we made, and that was back in late 2016. The price of Bitcoin was trading at about $1,000. I really thought that when we started to buy Bitcoin, this magical gold, this gold 2.0, this finite supply, able to have value and trust in a decentralized manner, that that was going to be my love affair over. It was going to finish at that. I had some Bitcoin. Isn't that great? I can now get back to doing what I do. What I didn't realize is that it was actually just the start. 2017, the total market capitalization combined was about, 20, uh, was about $20 billion. By the end of 2017, total market capitalization combined was about $800 billion. It's amazing that at the start of 2017, how little people were interested, certainly from the financial space, the legal space, the compliance space, they weren't interested because it was too small. When you have a 40x return, it gets everyone interested. And the calls that I received, or maybe people that wouldn't take my calls back in early 2017 to the end of 2017 was, was quite amazing. We've had an amazing run and it had to happen like this. But where are we now? After the markets going from an 800 billion all the way down to 141 to 150 billion like they are right now, what, what does it feel like? How do we navigate from here moving forward? For me, it always feels like it's kind of 1994. It almost feels like we're kind of pre-Netscape. It really feels early. And in order to move from where we did in 94, 95 to where we are currently, we have to have education. We have to have people understand exactly what we have. I've prepared a little video which shows you what it was like back in 1994, 1995. You can now glimpse the future with nothing more than a modem, a phone line, and a few dollars a month. That little mark with the A and then the ring around it. At. See, that's what I said. Mm -hmm. um, Katie said she thought it was about. Yeah. Oh. But I'd never heard or it. Around. I'd never heard it about. said. I'd always seen the mark, but never yeah. heard it said. And then yeah. it sounded stupid when I said it. Violence at NBC. 
Just what is this main artery of the information superhighway? Okay. Are a lot of people just getting on to the internet because they feel that they have to get onto the playing field, so to speak? Well, it's very hip to be on the internet right now. <laughs> there it is. Violence at NBC, GE, com. I mean... Well, well Allison should know. What, what do you is say internet about anyway? Internet is uh, that massive computer right. network. Mm -hmm. The one that's becoming really big now. What do you mean? That's big. How does one? What do you write to it like mail? No, a lot of people use it and communicate. I guess they can communicate with NBC writers and producers. Allison, can you explain what internet is? There's Allison. Can you explain what internet is? There's Allison. Can you explain what internet is? No, she can't say anything in ten seconds or less. Uh -huh. <laughs> They hadn't an absolute clue what internet was. They thought it was a big computer that you write to. If you look, they didn't even have an at sign. It was an A with a circle around it. That's where we are right now. We're at $150 billion market cap. It sounds like a lot. It's really not. I mean, it's absolutely tiny. If you go back and look at the market capitalization just of technology companies back in 1999, the total market capitalization of technology companies listed on the NASDAQ Stock Exchange and the New York Stock Exchange was about 6.7 trillion. That's not inflation adjusted. I could probably move that anywhere to 12 to 15 trillion. When we look at where we are right now, we are so early in this. And for that, there's an opportunity here. There's one big opportunity. The market outlook. Well, it's kind of interesting really what you've seen happen in, in the last week and certainly in the last few days. The market has really decoupled, right? And when you look at market movements, markets, certainly the cryptocurrency markets, there's so many experts out there. There's so many technical analysis people with different lines and different charts. There's so many people telling you how an ICO is going to go because they're a guru in the ICO. It's all nonsense. The market is driven totally by sentiment. And sentiment is emotion. And emotion is driven by fear and greed. And fear goes through the market so much quicker than greed. We haven't figured out how to value these. There's no DCF or PE. There's very little M&A activity, and there's certainly very little usage and definitely no revenue model. But we're going to get there, but we have to realize where we are in order to get there. So when you see price action like you've seen, that's one side of the story. But for me, it's the least interesting. It's just price movement. The underlying tech is really what you have to look at. And the underlying tech is different and dislocated from the price action. The underlying tech is continuing to be built out each and every day. The underlying tech, the crazy people, as we had heard earlier on, the devs, the hackers, the people that are leaving Google, Facebook, the people that are leaving Deloitte, the people that are leaving Goldman Sachs, Merrill Lynch, Morgan Stanley, the people that are coming and joining our gang, our community, are hard at work building, building, building. And that's what you have to have faith in. That's what you have to look at. So the market outlook for me looks extremely positive, although the price action is negative. That's an opportunity. Institutional barriers. Everybody talks about institutional money, institutional money, institutional money. And to a certain extent, I agree. I ran institutional money for over 15 years of my life. I get it. I understand what they're looking for. I know what they're going to do. I understand that when you look at a 40x return in 2017 in that asset class, there's nothing anywhere near that with regards to the bond market, the equity market, or the property market. But for institutional capital to come in, there has to be some resolution to the following. We have to have a regulatory framework. We welcome a regulatory framework. It allows us to know what we're going to do and how we can do it. Regulation is positive. It permits us to uh, be active in a space and suit the guidelines of the regulator. Regulation is positive, it's clear, it's good, and more importantly, it helps the little man. Nobody wants to see anybody get into any type of ICO whereby they don't understand or they don't know where the money is going to. We need to protect the little man, but also we need some real clarity on how we can build enterprise level solutions. Of course, we need a, a custody solution because if any larger hedge fund money manager is moving into the space, Holding your tokens in a trezor and putting underneath your desk, as one portfolio, German, one portfolio manager told me recently, he had a trezor with over $200 million worth of tokens in his desk drawer. He did not say that on a recorded line, but I guarantee you his investors did not know that. Because it's difficult to find a solution whereby a third party custody solution can come in. And the custody solution already has a business in equities and fixed income. And this would only be a small piece of their business, but they don't want to 
upset the banks that they work for, and they don't want to upset the regulators so that there's risk involved in it because they don't have a custody yet. But it's changing. We've seen a lot of movements in, in that space. And of course, inst institutional grade exchanges. You know, wiring money over to an exchange in Asia that has a different corporate name to the underlying exchange is not a, is not, it's not a solution. It's not acceptable. We need to have exchanges which are transparent. We need to have exchanges that are regulated. We need to have ex exchanges that have some clarity on where their deposits are held. It's really, really important. And we're not there yet, but we will be. So it's still hard to connect. Like buying cryptocurrency, it's not as easy as taking out your iPhone. And we forget what it was like. But let me just play you this video to show you what it was like connecting to the internet back in the day. With the assistance of the outside broadcast unit, we will be linking from the database studio to their home. Pat Green and Julian, welcome to database. Hello, Jane. Hello, Jane. That looks now, like Julian, Fred West. I see you have your computer linked to the telephone line. Can you tell us how you did that? Yes, well, it's very simple, really. Um, the telephone is connected to the telephone network with a British Telecom plug. And I simply remove the telephone jack from the telecom socket and plug it into this box here, the modem. I then take another wire from the modem and plug it in where the telephone was. I can then switch on the modem and we're ready to go. Um, the computer is asking me if I want to log on and it's now telling me to phone up the main press cell computer, which I will now do. Really simple. Um, so it's a very simple connection to make. Extremely simple. Um, and I can actually leave the modem plug plugged in once it's done that without affecting the telephone. I'm now waiting for the computer to answer me. It asks with a tone, and then I just flick the a switch on the receiver. modem and replace the receiver. And things are starting to happen. Things are starting to happen. The Presto computer is now asking me to enter my own personal password, which I've now done. One, two, three, four. And it comes up with an, op an opening screen. It's ridiculous, but it's actually reality back in the early, early, early 90s. And that feels like when we all try to buy and sell from an exchange. You think it's going to be simple. And you've got private keys, and you've got public keys, and you've got exchange, and you've got different APIs, and you have to wait in different block times and checking and different decimal points. And it's a bit of a pain. It's a really bit of a pain. But it will all get sorted out, because look how we connect to the internet right now. We pick up this thing called the iPhone. And we hit that button with a G on it called Google. And within a matter of a second, we get connected. And if it takes three seconds, we get really, really annoyed. All those problems will get sorted out. So don't get disheartened. It's the opportunity that we see. So where are we going? Well, in order to go anywhere, we need to have mass adoption. We need to have individuals using. If you don't have individuals using, then you just have blockchains, DLTs, Excel sheets, all distributed, but for what good? They have to be used, and in order for them to be used, the case has to be compelling. With regards to scalability, we can't be in a situation whereby we're waiting for 15 minutes, or 30 seconds, or block times to be mined. It has to be scalable at a rate whereby when you're building a DAP, that it's scalable into infancy. It has to be as good as central systems, if not better because that's what we need. So the dApps of the future, what are they going to look like? You know, where, when, when, when we look at in investment themes, what are we looking at? Well, we're not looking at some coin or token that's going to be for a 65-year-old based in north of England who can go down to their dentist and use dentist coin in order to get 10% off the utility of the dentist in that area. That's just not going to work. Not yet, anyway. Not for maybe another 20 years. What are we looking at with regards to the infrastructure play? We're having the roads, the rail, all the plumbing is being put down. So that was our first in, in, in investments into the space. But dApps of the future will have to have certain attributes to them. 
And social media is a theme that we really like. We're seeing a lot of, lot of, lot of great projects being built out in social media. The scalability is not there yet. We've been dealing with a lot of supply chains, uh, a, lot of, a lot of existing companies that have supply chains that want to prove farm to fork. They want to have authenticity at each and every point. We're looking at a, a fashion company right now which is looking to have an enterprise solution for that. Gaming, of course, um, the gamers have been mining digital gold since inception, since the early 2000s. They understand in-game currency. They understand digital gold. They understand avatars. They understand that digital assets can have a price. Of course, data management as well. Um, it is absolutely huge for the blockchain space and, and payment networks are all themes that we look at each and every day. However, response user experience, it must be positive. The ability to scale with demand has to just be a given. It has to be frictionless experience for the users. I think the apps that will, that will survive this current round of funding, the dApps that will be used almost have to feel like they're not a dApp. They almost have to feel like they're a central system, but the UX and UI experience are positive for the user. And of course, they have to be uh, away from any, any, any type of formulation or centralization. So, with regards to the future, what do we do? I love this HODL. Hold on for dear life. And I've seen so many of the HODLs all for the last few days. Lots of memes, lots of people talking about it. But for us, our view, our vision, and I always ask the guys this each and every day, What's changed fundamentally? Like, do you believe or don't you? If you don't believe, then maybe you should go off and do something else. But if you believe in decentralization, if you believe in a future which will be better for all, if you believe in, in, in remuneration for users, if you believe in managing your own data, if you believe in voting systems which will be transparent, if you believe in authenticity, if you believe in an incentive layer, then fundamentally nothing's really changed. In fact, each and every day that we stay alive and that this industry attracts more and more people and we start to see more and more professional structures come into the space, if you believe, then the price action doesn't interest me. If you believe you have conviction, and fundamentally for us at SVK Crypto, we've never believed more. We stay laser focused on building out an investment team, advising our fund, and continuing to remain engaged. During this bear market, and having gone through two bear markets on the equity side, you'll find that the best projects actually come out of hardest times, because they can manage their capital correctly, because they're bootstrapping, because they have the ability to make something happen. Having too much capital, certainly for, for projects, whether they be the ICOs of 2017 or now we're starting to see more, more, more movement into the STO market. Certainly we're involved in a lot of private rounds um, with regards to almost venture capital. If you can build and survive in times like this, like we know you can, when this market goes from a 150 billion to a 200 billion to a 250 to a 2.5 trillion to a 20 trillion, that's when you're going to see the rewards. So for us, we've never been more focused, we've never been more excited, and the future definitely says H-O-D-L. Thank you all very much for your time today.